afternoon, everyone. This event will be held by the Rio de Janeiro City Attorney's Office in partnership with Emerge, the School of Judges. We thank you, Professor Mark Tushnet, for accepting the invitation. And the Professor Mark, Mark Tushnet has have a lot of books, classic books. I have one of them, one of these books here with me. It's a great book. So the biography of Professor Mark Tushnet is extensive. Uh, Professor Luis Claudio will talk about this biography more uh, a little bit later. So at this time, we are we are pleased to take Professor Mark Tushnet with this event. And I, I'm here with Professor Teresa Gaulia, that's judge, judge in Brazil, Professor Ana Paula and Professor Rodrigo Brandão, and they are also public attorney in Brazil and professors. And Professor Luis Claudio, that uh, built the bridge with Professor Mark Tushnet to, uh, to have him in this event. So, uh, Professor Mark Tushnet, we have here in the audience public attorneys and judges, students from Brazil, and we hope that we enjoy this event because we, we will learn a lot with you. I, I'm sure about that. And I would like to uh, open in this event uh, saying that it's a great honor and the, oh, uh, the doors will be open for another lectures with Professor Mark Tushnet and another professor from all over the world. So Professor Teresa Gaulia, you have uh, opening words to say about this event, please. Yes, thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon to all public attorneys and to my fellow judges. And a very special good afternoon to Professor Mark Tushnet. I will start this brief introduction saying how, how honored Emerge, the judges school in the state of Rio de Janeiro is to be able to offer to our, all our judges the chance to listen to one of the most important American constitutionalists of our time. Professor Mark Victor Tushnet is a specialist on constitutional law and theory, including vast studies on comparative constitutional law, being currently Emeritus Professor of Law at Harvard Law School. In his studies, he has shown a strong opposition to the idea that courts should be allowed to review the Constitution or establish the validity of legislative acts. For this power, thus say the professor, would belong only to the people. According to Professor Tushnet, in the line of his critical legal studies, lawyers, judges, and scholars should understand the idea of constitutional hard game in order to reflect more properly how politics and the law are played in the so-called democratic societies. Beside the book that was shown to us by Rafael, the library at Emerge has also to other books of the professor. Taking back the Constitution, activist, activist judges and the next age of American law and why the Constitution matters. I think Kelsen, Hans Kelsen would be very happy to read Professor Tushnet's books. And these books are considered surprising and highly unconventional work, being extremely important studies to all of us to understand that sometimes, many times maybe, certain political practice, practices are not compatible with what the Constitutional allows. 
we want to hear you about all that. I give you the, the place of word. word. Professor uh, Kush. Thank you very much for that very uh, gracious introduction. Uh, I want to begin by uh, expressing my regrets that I'm not able to be uh, in Brazil in person. I've been uh, coming to Brazil every couple of years uh, for short visits to familiarize myself with developments in Brazilian constitutionalism since I, I think 2007 or eight. Uh, and uh, uh, obviously a combination of the pandemic and my increasing age uh, has uh, made that impossible uh, this year. Uh, but I have tried to uh, keep in touch with developments by uh, paying attention to uh, uh, newspaper uh, stories. Um, second introductory comment is that I began to, or I agreed to uh, give this lecture uh, when I thought I would be talking about, or at least presenting comments in the framework of the ongoing Chilean uh, constitutional process. Uh, which I've both observed and in a weird kind of way uh, been a minor participant in. <clears throat> but uh, that process, uh, and we scheduled this event uh, when it was supposed to occur after the elections for the constituent body uh, in, in Chile, but those elections have been postponed uh, and so I had to reconfigure my, uh, my talk, uh, although many of the things that I was going to say about Chile are going to be built into what I have to say. Um, I'm going to be talking about the, what I'm calling the politics of constitution making. And uh, this is a very preliminary um, uh, uh, sketch of a larger project that I'll be working on over the next several months. And so I welcome uh, both from participants in the Zoom conversation who can do so directly and comments from YouTube viewers who can contact me via email. I, I welcome both elaborations and questions and additional examples. Okay, so to begin, um, the, the topic is the politics of constitution making. And the first point I have to get on the table is that to talk about that in a coherent kind of way, uh, we have to define some sort of time frame for the discussion. Um, one, there are many possibilities uh, some that would have very extended time periods, others that would have much shorter ones. I've chosen a relatively condensed time frame. So my discussion is about the politics of constitution making when, as I put it, the project of making a constitution uh, emerges and becomes politically salient. Um, you could talk, extending the time period back to an earlier period, in your earlier time, about the politics that lead up to the perception that the Constitution needs to be changed or abandoned or whatever. Uh, um, uh, and so, you know, for Brazil, in some sense, uh, that story would talk about um, uh, some aspects of the events uh, during the dictatorship that produced the pressure that ultimately led to the dictatorship's um, collapse and so on. Uh, and so, but I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about, sort of, we now know that there's going to be a project of constitution making. What's the politics associated with that? Then at the other end, uh, when does the uh, time period conclude? Um, and I'm going to take the concluding point to be when the Constitution is ratified or uh, rejected 
in a definitive kind of way. Um, uh, on that latter point, again, there are longer time frames. So Bruce Ackerman's current project takes the end point of the constitution making process, the actual sort of permanent, as permanent as these things get, installation of the constitution as the governing doctorate document of the country. Um, and he has an argument that uh, there has to be a transition in leadership uh, for that period to come to an end. Um, on the definitive rejection point, uh, I, I want to note, because I, I will say, at least in the larger project, something about this. I don't want to take an initial rejection to be the conclusion of the analysis. Um, I would note that because of the voting rules in Chile, um, I think there's some chance that the proposal that uh, there will be a proposal that goes to the people that proposal will be i think there's some chance that it will be incomplete uh, and so the new constitution won't actually be in place when the document is uh, approved by the people i want to leave open the possibility of talking about what happens after that uh, more concretely with an existing example uh, there was a constitution drafting process in Iceland, which received a great deal of attention around the world. Uh, it was approved in a referendum, uh, but the rules required its approval by parliament and parliament refused to do so for reasons that I'll talk about. Uh, but the constitution making project remains on the political agenda uh, and, and it's, uh, the short version of the story is that an insurgent political party, the Pirate Party, which sounds like a joke, but is actually a serious party in uh, Scandinavian countries, the Pirate Party campaigned for the revival of the constitutional project, project and came close enough to success for the new coalition that excluded the Pirate Party to say, yes, they would take up the constitution making project again. So I wanna be able to talk about that kind of process. Okay, so roughly the project begins, it's put on the table and it ends with a ratification or a final refusal. There's, in my view, surprisingly little general theorizing about the politics associated with constitution making. There's a fair amount on specific issues uh, and specific settings um, from which some general ideas uh, can be extracted. Um, um, the most general framework that I'm aware of is from the uh, Norwegian, US, whatever affiliation you want to give him, uh, constitutionalist John Elstair, who in a very important article uh, distinguishes between what he calls upstream and downstream constraints on the constitution making process. And that's actually the framework I'm going to use. I'll talk about them in more detail in a moment. I've already mentioned uh, Bruce Ackerman's current project. Um, that is also an attempt to provide a general theorization or perhaps better three general theorizations of constitution making. But as I've suggested, his time frame is uh, much more extended than the one that I want to use here. Um, and my own view is that uh, his, his theoretical approach, which is derived from Max Weber and relies on notions of uh, ideal types, um, washes out too much interesting detail. Uh, but that's another story. And I don't want to disparage his project. It's a disagreement that deserves scholarly exploration. Okay, so uh, uh, um, I'm going to take Elstair's 
uh, framework as my uh, as my uh, concepts as my framework. Um, he talks about upstream and downstream constraints. I'll describe them uh, and then actually move back and describe in more abstract terms what constraints are, uh, and then I'll turn to how they uh, operate. So the upstream constraints are the conditions that shape the initial uh, um, project of constitution making and the charge given somehow to the constitution making process. Um, what is it? Uh, so the constitution making process is charged with amending the constitution or revising it or replacing it. What are the conditions that lead to choices among those, uh, uh, those uh, charges? Um, uh, and so, so in Chile, uh, um, there's the social movement uh, in many places, I'll talk about this more as well. In many places, there are social movements that are uh, generally critical of the overall political system. That both, in, in Colombia's good example, both major political parties have failed uh, to solve sustained problems. And there's a social movement, an extra party movement that, uh, um, that pushes the constitutional project. Uh, that's a large part of what happened in Chile, but with the qualification that although there was substantial public discontent with the political system as a whole, the political parties, and in my view in particular, the conservative political party uh, had quite substantial political uh, power. And so it was able to shape the constitution making process, the charge given to the constitution making process in a way that the existing political parties were not able uh, to do in Colombia or uh, Venezuela. Okay, so that again, the upstream constraints are what are what's the politics at the time the project starts uh, the downstream constraints are the conditions necessary for the constitution to be put into force. Uh, um, what's it going to take in order to, uh, to get the constitution up at the new constitution up and running. Now I distinguish, I think Elsir does too, uh, between anticipated down, downstream constraints and actual downstream constraints. The anticipated constraints operate at the drafting stage. As the actors say to themselves, um, we have to do thus and so if there's to be any chance that this will be adopted. So in the United States uh, in the 1787 project, um, the actors said, uh, we have to accommodate slavery in the South somehow, if there's any chance for this to be uh, 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 go into force. Um, uh, I, I, my guess is that in the Chilean process, uh, my weird sort of involvement brought this to my attention, um, the drafters, the actors will say to themselves, we know that conservative forces that still um, um, think that there were good aspects to the Pinochet dictatorship are going to have power once we put our project on the table and we're going to have to uh, do something uh, to make sure that they are uh, willing to go along with the project. Those are anticipated downstream constraints. Um, but the actors don't always anticipate what those constraints are. Um, and sometimes, uh, as I'll mention in a moment, they're themselves actually structurally constrained to ignore downstream constraints. So in the Icelandic process, it was entirely popularly driven 
uh, with deliberately with no participation by the two major political parties uh, who were unenthusiastic about the, the project. Um, and uh, my interpretation of what happened was that the drafters said, we're going to come up with the best constitution we can imagine and didn't think about what was going to happen downstream when the existing political parties were going to have to sign on to the project. And in the event, they didn't uh, sign on to the project. In the Chilean process, um, uh, this is again tricky, uh, but at least as a formal matter, uh, political parties are relegated to a secondary role in the process. They're not excluded. Uh, as they were in uh, Iceland, but it remains to be seen to what extent the repudiation of the political parties affects the drafting process in ways that might affect its prospects for rat ratification. Okay, so now I've given you an idea of what the upstream and downstream constraints are. Uh, I've also described in some specific ways what the constraints are. But I want to now give us a, a sort of abstract characterization of these constraints. The constraints are institutions that mediate popular participation in constitution making. So in many instance, instances, uh, these institutions are the existing political parties. Um, in some constitution making processes, the parties, or let me do it this way, in some constitution making processes, the members of the constituent assembly are elected as members of political parties. The parties run candidates for the constituent assembly. But in addition, uh, there are civil society organizations, uh, non governmental organizations, the social movements that I've turned, uh, that I've talked about. And, and important in modern times, although not trivial in the past, international actors uh, who operate at actually uh, all three uh, stages of the process. Um, so for example, international actors in, in certain settings, um, typically post-conflict settings, uh, international actors push for adopting a constitution. During the drafting process, international actors provide advice, either solicited or unsolicited, about what should go into the constitution. Um, as in, before we uh, um, uh, started this session, uh, there was a side conversation referring to uh, an earlier presentation by in which I participated uh, by Bruce Ackerman, in which he offered unsolicited advice about the, what a Brazilian constitution making process should be like. Um, there are other mechanisms for more formal uh, um, uh, interventions. And then after uh, a, a constitution is presented, uh, developed, these international actors will evaluate it and criticize it. So again, in Iceland, the process um, produced a draft constitution for political reasons. It was submitted to the Venice Commission for evaluation. Um, at the Venice Commission's evaluation, uh, the Venice Commission is a body of the Council of Europe that provides constitutional assessments of both large scale and small scale uh, developments uh, in, in uh, constitutional developments in Europe. The commission uh, reported uh, identifying as it inevitably would flaws in the constitution, which then had ramifications for the ongoing political process. So now a final point on constraints as institutions. Uh, um, there's increasing interest in the constitution making community in uh, crowdsourcing 
the constitution constitution making process. Iceland is de de described as a crowdsourced process. There are examples from Ireland of interesting crowdsourcing of constitutional revisions. Um, uh, opponents of crowdsourcing say that it eliminates the mediating effect of pre-existing institutions because it there's no intermediary between the people and the drafting body. Uh, that in fact is, it could be true and it might become truer over time uh, as technological uh, advances occur. But right now, uh, all I think you can say is that crowdsourcing reduces but doesn't eliminate the institutionalized mediation uh, that are these constraints. Okay, so now set out the framework and describe the uh, concepts. Uh, let me, I'll start, uh, the, the next parts of the talk are about the, th the three stages, uh, um, initiating, drafting, and uh, ratifying. What are the upstream constraints? That is, what are the political conditions under which a constitution drafting project gets going? And how do those conditions uh, affect the constitution making process generally? Now here there is a literature about basically three or two and a half general conditions uh, with some overlap. Um, so first there is a literature on post-conflict constitution making, meaning basically there's been a civil war that has come to an, in, an inconclusive military outcome. And the two sides exhausted from military combat sit down to make peace through the constitution as a, as a peace treaty, as it's referred to sometimes in the literature. Okay, so, and there's a literature about the conditions of a post-conflict uh, constitution making. There's also literature about a constitution making in deeply divided societies where the divisions haven't manifested themselves in sustained military combat, but rather in sustained social tension and uh, uh, eruptions of disorder. Uh, and again, the parties say, well, maybe a constitution, we can devise a constitution that will uh, resolve our conflicts in a permanent way. And then the half example is a small literature on constitution making under non-crisis related conditions. Um, I think of these as constitution making under normal conditions. Uh, it's not entirely clear, and I have to think more about this, what this category includes. We do have one really good example, which is Norway, uh, a kind of nation that revised, completely re rewrote its constitution a um, hundred years after its, its origin, just because they thought it was out of date. There was no ongoing uh, urgency. Uh, nobody was pressing very hard for it. But it just seemed, you know, a hundred years had gone by. Things, technologies of governance were available that could be taken into account. And so they, they uh, revised the constitution. The, the problem cases are cases like uh, uh, Chile and in my view, Colombia and Venezuela Colombia in 1990, Venezuela in 1998, when uh, there is widespread dissatisfaction with the operation of the political system in place, the political parties. Um, uh, although there's, it's dissatisfaction that hasn't produced um, dramatic stress in the streets, except around the issue of doing a new constitution. Uh, so I just in, in Chile, as I'm sure you know, there was uh, a um, the initial impetus for the constitutional revision process were street demonstrations 
around what I think everybody in Chile understands to be uh, trivial increases in the price of uh, fares on public transit. It's just that that it wasn't that people were you know, outraged at these new higher prices. What they were outraged at was that the political system had generated these higher prices without being aware of what the people of the country wanted. And so the focus shifted rather quickly from the fare increases to doing a new constitution. My own view is that that's so quite, is that that's similar to what happened in Colombia and Venezuela, again, at their initial stages. I, I'm not sure whether these should be characterized as crisis situations or as normal constitution making. Um, I, I have to, as I say, I have to think more about it. Okay. So uh, when agitation for a constitution making process begins, there's some array of political power. Post-conflict, there are representatives of both sides, uh, one of which might have been defeated militarily, but which might retain some political or other forms of power. Uh, that's the best characterization in my view of what happened in South Africa in the 1990s process, the, uh, a, the uh, African Na National Congress had prevailed in its freedom struggle. It had won, uh, but the white apartheid rulers, prior rulers, basically were still in control of the economy uh, and had the connections to the international economy that were important for success of South Africa as a nation post-apartheid. Uh, and so they had to be taken into account in the constitution-making process. As I've mentioned, I think something like that is true in Chile uh, with the conservative parties as the political heirs of uh, Pinochet. Now, in these situations, either particular parties or the party system as a whole, has been discredited to a greater or lesser extent, uh, which means that they'll have less power in the constitution making exercise than they would in ordinary politics, which is exactly why their opponents want to shift from ordinary politics to constitution making. It's a way of displacing or, or, or uh, well, taking advantage of the circumstances of the discrediting of the political parties. Um, um, social movements are important actors when there's a generalized discrediting. Uh, uh, it, it's rare, not, not unknown, but it's rare for a single party that was around at the time to take a leadership position in discrediting the party system as a whole. That may have happened. I, you can correct me on this, but uh, uh, if I'm wrong, it, it may have happened with the uh, uh, PT in Brazil in the 1988 period, because it was, my understanding, it was sort of the only sort of independent force that had political organization. But um, if I'm wrong about Brazil, it doesn't really matter for my uh, overall argument. Um, I, what is interesting is that uh, social movements can be important actors in the generalized discrediting and then become political parties afterwards. Uh, and indeed, in, in the many Latin example, Latin American examples, uh, we can see that happening. So in Bolivia, the indigenous social movement was fueled the constitutional replacement, and then became the uh, Morales political party. I forget what its name is, MSM, I think, but whatever its name is, it became the political party. Similarly, in, in Venezuela, uh, before the constitution making process existed, there was Chavez, uh, at, but there wasn't a Chavistas party. He won election, uh, promising a constitutional uh, uh, revision, and then formed the party around himself. Um, 
uh, now, okay. Um, on the pre-existing party system, uh, or maybe let me do it this, the pre-existing political forces are sometimes, but not always represented by political parties, sometimes by social movement organizations. Um, I, I just want to note where parties are personalistic, uh, they're unlikely to have a role, a large role in the process leading to constitution making. Um, it's only where uh, an opportunistic, uh, I don't use this word in a disparaging way, uh, an ambitious political leader sees an opening for personal advancement through constitutional revision that you will get a personalistic political party pushing constitutional revision. But that's unusual. Maybe Chavez is an example of that. Uh, I, I know uh, I, have, I have a less uh, jaundiced view of Chavez as a person than most scholars of Latin America, uh, Latin American constitutionalism uh, do. Um, and so I'm typically willing to be more generous in thinking about Chavez than most people are. I, Maduro is another matter entirely, uh, but Chavez, I think, is a complicated figure uh, in this process. Okay, so again, personalistic party is not going to have much participation. Um, in, in normal times, uh, um, in terms of these three categories, post-crisis, post-conflict, and normal times. Uh, uh, in normal times, the concern, as I've suggested, is for updating and integrating accretions uh, to the Constitution. Probably um, uh, in normal times, you're going to get more technocratic revisions, uh, a larger role for legal experts than for political parties. Uh, I do want to learn more about the Norwegian process to see if that's right. Um, so what I've done now is sketch out the possibilities of how these, how the pre-existing array of political parties, political forces affects the politics at the time the project gets going. Um, why do they operate as constraints, that is limitations on the project? Um, well, it's easiest to see when there are reasonably well-organized political parties in ordinary politics. Um, they will deploy their resources in the run-up to constitution making. Uh, so, for example, uh, they will, the parties will put forth proposed rules for organizing the process in Chile. There's a component of it that says only things that get two thirds approval will, uh, um, will be built into the new constitution. And that's the product of political pressure exerted by the existing political parties, discredited though to the extent that they were, though they were, they still were able to extract that kind of uh, concession. Um, uh, when the, how does that happen? Well, the, I, the Chilean example is one where there's direct participation. Um, in other places, the direct participation of the parties may be small. Um, uh, if the process in, as in Iceland and in Chile is uh, nonpartisan, ordinary citizens uh, only. Um, uh, they're the parties, they're formally excluded from participating, but they come in through the back door. Uh, they do so uh, by, uh, by uh, sort of continuing to agitate, to act as political parties do. Uh, take stances about what should be done. And the participants in the process are not, um, they may be nonpartisan in a formal sense, but they're not isolated from what's going on in the society. 
And so they will hear and think about uh, what the uh, uh, parties are, are saying. And then, of course, and I'll come back to this in a moment uh, when I get to later, when I get to the ratification process, um, uh, many of the participants in the process, though nominally nonpartisan, actually have partisan affiliations. Um, I've done another study in which it, looking at the composition of nonpartisan uh, electoral management bodies is what I looked at. And it turns out it's very difficult to define nonpartisan in a way that actually excludes people with party affiliations. And so my expectation is that in Chile, uh, not only will be the, po po the politician participants, that, but there will be identifiable factions of the public participants who can be described as party leaners. Um, okay, so that's what I have to say about the upstream constraints. Um, uh, now let me turn to the drafting uh, participant process itself. Um, I, I have a few scattered observations here. Uh, the most important one I think begins with the idea of not the most important, but one important one, is the idea of popular participation in drafting as an emerging norm. I don't think it's quite caught on and uh, to, to be described as a uh, firm norm of the process, but uh, it's clear that many ongoing constitution making processes, and I think likely more in the future, will involve popular participation in the drafting itself, the crowdsourcing idea in a variety of ways. Um, or, or just to adopt you know, a phrase, and maybe even the institutional forms that you have in Brazil, uh, participatory constitution making on the model of participatory budgeting. Uh, uh, okay, now, what will, what will the politics of popular participation uh, look like? Uh, there's a recent book, I think maybe just published by Alexander Hudson uh, on certain aspects of popular participation in constitution making. Um, and he describes a number of case studies in which he sees what he calls party-driven popular participation. That is the parties organize forms of public participation, they coordinate input, they give cues to sympathizers within the convention. So on the coordinating input, um, I don't think Hudson observed this in Iceland, but uh, he did in Kenya, I know, and, it, it, in, and in South Africa. Um, and I think his study includes Brazil in 1988, but I'm now I'd have to go back and look at it. Um, so popular participation that he looks at involve uh, letters to uh, the convention drafters. Um, and he's able to show that parties coordinated what looked like individual letters to uh, the convention members. Um, in modern administrative law in the United States, uh, we call this astroturfing. It looks like you're getting something from the grassroots, but actually it's been organized by in the US interest groups, but here in political parties. Um, uh, the important point to get out of Hudson's analysis, I think, uh, is that people with uh, political and other forms of power before the convention usually don't simply go away. They're still around, and so they're going to still try to influence what happens in the convention. I do want to note that sometimes they actually do go away entirely. In the United States, the um, 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 British sympathizers just left 
they, they, uh, they, they moved away. And so there were no opponents, uh, pre-existing opponents of the constitutional project. There were divisions among the constitution project's members themselves, but the opposition had literally gone to Canada or back to England. In, in Venezuela, I think what happened was that the opposition was so discouraged that it couldn't manage to organize itself effectively. Um, there, there are, you know, there, I have two sort of data points on it. They're not even data points, they're impressions. One is that the uh, constitutional court that approved the Chavez refer um, um, constitution constituent assembly was not a Chavista constitutional court. It was dominated, it was controlled by the previous regime. Chavez hadn't had any appointments to it, as I recall, at the time it made its decision. Uh, but they, they, uh, uh, they said, okay, go ahead and have a constituent assembly. Uh, one view was that they had a legal theory that said it was okay. Another view, more prominent in the literature, is that they were um, disheartened. Um, the other data point is just about, it is about Chavez personally. He was a crude, lower class kind of guy. And the previous political order had been controlled by elites, both conservative and liberal, and they just couldn't believe that they were about to be governed by this lower class boor. Uh, uh, and so they, you know, they just couldn't see him as a serious political actor. And so they didn't organize seriously against him. I, my own view is that's continued to happen to the present. Uh, um, again, but again, Maduro is a different person from Chavez. Uh, um, okay, ordinarily, the pre-existing forces are still around and they will do what they can to influence the drafting itself using various media, astroturfing and the like. Second important point about, um, about the drafting process is uh, the, uh, now this really is a very close to strongish norm uh, in constitution making, it's a norm of transparency. Uh, most of what has to be, which, what is done, uh, should be done in the open. Now, Elsner has some very uh, good comments on why transparency can be a problem. Uh, you get people who play to the crowd uh, uh, and that obstructs compromise. Uh, just a, a footnote here, um, many of the things that are said about transparency and constitution making uh, can be and have been said about the uh, Brazilian federal constitutional, uh, Supreme Federal Court's process of open, transparent deliberation. Um, and in particular, the playing to the crowd point. Uh, again, my view is that that sometimes occurs. It's not as prevalent as I think most critics think it is, but it does and can, it certainly can and uh, does occur. Um, Transparency, Elsner says, also has this problem, which is, okay, so maybe we are gonna come up with a compromise on some issue, but we're going to have to present it as principle. When it's, it's actually just the deal that we managed to make, uh, um, maybe an unprincipled, messy compromise, but when we're talking in public, we're gonna have to talk about it in principle terms, <clears throat> and that might be quite difficult. Um, secrecy allows for such compromises to occur with arguments cast in terms of principle that can be developed later rather than in real time. So again, the US example is there are lots of messy compromises in the drafting of the 1789 Constitution. The, the drafting is done completely in secret. 
Um, when the document is presented to the public for ratification, <clears throat> then <clears throat> the authors of the Federalist Papers generate uh, principled rationales for these compromises. Um, okay, so, and then finally on transparency, some degree of non-transparency is inevitable. Uh, and <clears throat> so there will be conversations in the corridor about particular issues and about even large scale kinds of uh, concerns. Um, there will be dinner parties where people from both sides will sit down together uh, and talk among other things about the work that they're doing. Um, and so although there is this norm of transparency, the process will be at best semi-transparent. And then finally, in terms of the political calculations of the actors, there's a question of, um, as I would put it, the, um, the opacity of the veil of ignorance under which they're operating. What I mean by this is that is this, uh, they are devising a constitution that is going to start working let's just say a year from now, I think Chile it's two years, but it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it's gonna start working two, some time from now. We don't know what the political circumstances will be like at that time. And so, and that's one point, we don't know what the circumstances will be at that time. In addition, call that a short time horizon approach. In addition, there's a long time horizon. We hope that this constitution will work for the indefinite future. And we certainly have no idea what politics are gonna be like 20 years from now, okay? So they're operating under uh, a veil of ignorance about what's going to happen when the constitution gets, uh, um, um, uh, goes into effect. Uh, but the time horizon point is a significant one because um, they, they will have, they might have some sense of what's likely to happen in the short term, that is right after the constitution is adopted. Uh, the most obvious examples are actually the ones that uh, Ackerman's most recent book focuses on where you have a dominant party and a charismatic leader who you know is going to be the president. So in South Africa, they knew that the African National Congress was going to be the dominant political party and that Nelson Mandela was going to be the president. And they knew about what the politics of the Congress party were and about who Mandela was. And in particular, they knew, so they knew the Congress party, the, the African National Congress was a very complicated um, factional uh, uh, organization. And they knew Mandela knew how to manage the factions. So they didn't have to worry about the party breaking apart in the first years after it took power because they knew Mandela was gonna be president and he'd, he'd handle things. Um, similarly, in the United States, everybody knew that George Washington was gonna be the first president and they knew his character. In India, everybody knew that the Congress party was going to be the dominant part. After, after um, um, separation, separation of Pakistan from uh, India. Everybody knew uh, that the uh, um, Congress party was going to be the dominant party. Um, okay, so, 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 so that's where they knew when they could make guesses, they could design the constitution in light of Mandela, ANC, George Washington, Congress party. And then similarly, these are cases where they have pretty high confidence, but there are other of, of who's gonna be in charge, 
There are other situations. I think Chile is one, if Brazil goes through a drafting process, Brazil will be another, where you can have pretty high confidence that you have no idea who's going to be in charge after the first election. Uh, there's genuine uncertainty about what the outcome of the first election will be. You sort of know that once it's in place, the parties will start figuring out ways to manipulate it and game it and do things to their own advantage. But you don't know who's going to be doing the gaming. Um, and that, that will affect the kinds of choices you make in the drafting process. So again, in, um, in, um, in, in South Africa and the United States, choosing a pres presidential system was simple. You could not worry about a prime ministerial system because you had Mandela and Washington right ready uh, for you. Uh, um, that decision is consequential. Um, if you were doing in Chile, they're coming out of a strong presidential system. Uh, they want to think about what, whether they should have presidentialism or semi-presidentialism or parliamentarism. Um, and they're making that decision under a high degree of uncertainty about the outcome. Um, they don't know if they adopt a presidential system. They don't know who the president's going to be. They don't even know what kind of party system uh, you're going to have. OK, uh, now, final, so that's what I have to say about the politics of the drafting process. Um, finally, the downstream constraints. I, I've mentioned the anticipated downstream constraints. Uh, to secure adoption, you know you have to do something. You have to have things in here that will get specific groups to go along slavery in the United States, conservative policies to some extent in Chile. Uh, um, I think my sense is the Chilean discussions are focusing on uh, fiscal policies, you know, the legacies of austerity and, and constrained, uh, constrained uh, spending that came out of the Pinochet era that fueled what was understood by conservatives at least to be uh, Chile's good economic performance in the Pinochet and post-Pinochet era. If you don't take account of these people, uh, you might end up with a failed effort, uh, as in Iceland. They didn't take account of the interests of the political parties, uh, and the parties opposed uh, ratification successfully. Um, now, first of all, I just, just want to conclude this on anticipating constraints. You, there's some constraints that you might not even think about. Uh, they, you might think about them and you might overestimate them. Um, I don't want to um, overemphasize the importance of anticipating constraints, uh, but it is a part of the political process of drafting a constitution. I want to turn finally to the actual constraints. So the actual constraints occur when there's a document it's presented to the public for ratification. Um, I want to make just two points and then I will finish. First, something that I've mentioned earlier, once the document is presented, it will be open to technical assessments. Um, technical assessments will, I think, always, in general, well, always skew towards opposition. Because for, for two reasons. One, the, every document has technical flaws. Uh, it's just inevitable. That's why you have an amendment process built into a constitution. You didn't think of something or you didn't see that there was an interaction that uh, was going to cause problems that happened in the United States with the uh, 
system for electing a president and vice president. And there had to be a constitutional amendment, the 12th Amendment, to solve this. Um, uh, so all documents are flawed. There, I just read, there's a wonderful story about the mathematician, it's not clear it's true, but about the mathematician Kurt Gödel, who was going to uh, take his citizen citizenship citizenship test in the United States, which involves being tested on the Constitution. Uh, and Gödel, who came up with an impossibility theorem about mathematics, said, you know, the Constitution is self-contradictory. Uh, and I'm a logician, so I know it. Um, and it's true. It, it, he identified something about the amendment process that is not self-contradictory, certainly a puzzle. Um, his friend said, if they don't mention it, don't talk about it. Uh, but again, it illustrates that Constitution being complicated documents are going to be technically flawed. That's one reason. The second reason is that the people doing the technical assessment have a, a I think of it as a job related interest in finding flaws. If they come up, if they say, as they did about Iceland, um, this is a pretty good document, and we don't really have much more to say about it. Well, why bother to get their evaluation? So in order to justify their work, they have to come up with flaws. Um, and flaws are exactly what opponents of the project uh, are, are looking for. Um, second and final point is that um, Final documents will include concessions and compromises. Again, that's inevitable. Um, at least, at least, unless you have a completely authoritarian drafting process. Um, these concessions or compromises simultaneously push in two directions. Um, they, of course, improve the chances of adoption because supporters can say to potential opponents, well, look, we did take your concerns into account. Here's the compromise that we engaged in. And so you ought to go along. Uh, but they also um, point in the other direction of reducing the chance of adoption because now potential supporters might say, your compromise went too far. You gave up more than you needed to give up in order to attract these uh, supporters. And we should have a do-over in which you will get it right. Or the opponents will say, yeah, you gave us some concessions, but they didn't go far enough. Um, again, in the U.S., the Bill of Rights uh, was the focal point of this, uh, 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 this concern. Um, uh, how these two forces, I think of it in economic terms, how these net out will depend both on the content of the Constitution and the array of political forces in place when the Constitution is put up uh, for ratification. Okay, so the conclude my only concluding comment is that um, these politics in the standard sense, ordinary politics, plays a role at every stage in the process of Constitution making. Um, and so maybe the way I should end this is again by turning back to Bruce Ackerman, who in his early work, focusing exclusively on the United States, but now has influenced his current work, famously came up with the idea of constitutional moments when, as he put it, the people in you know, capital letters, put ordinary politics aside and shift it into a mode of deliberation called constitution making. Um, I guess my argument is 
that that's not an accurate description of constitution making processes. <clears throat> Ordinary politics continue to play a role in constitution making, although the way or the forms that the ordinary politics takes are affected by the fact that this is a constitution making process rather than a deliberation over what the rate of taxation should be. Okay, so that's my presentation. Uh, I uh, hope it's been interesting and provocative and I look forward for, to questions and comments particularly because, as I said at the very beginning, uh, this I'm at the start of a larger project that i would be working on over the next several months at least. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dushnet, for a brilliant lecture, as usual. Professor Luis Claudio, as mediator of this lecture, feel free to present your thoughts about the, the, the lecture. Thank you, Professor Rafael. Thank you, Professor Tushnet. Well, first of all, thank you again for kindly accepting the invitation for the event. Uh, this lecture uh, provides the opportunity to reflect about this subject. It's quite interesting. Uh, well, I, I was I was wondering uh, about your your thoughts about that you share with us about one specific point that if you could light enlighten us about this that uh, was about the conservative force and about the the charismatic leadership that could put in jeopardy this uh, process of constitutional uh, making in Chile. But uh, I was wondering, I don't know if I'm, I'm correct, but I was wondering about some different authors for example, uh, Philippe T and Chantal Mouffe about the uh, agnostic democracy and contestatory democracy and about the idea of the importance of uh, citizen uh, partnership in this process, inside this process. So I was, I was wondering if these this, uh, charismatic leaders and of course, this conservative force could be blocked by this uh, this process of contestation from the society. So I don't know if I was clear about my point, but uh, I, I, I was wondering about this 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 uh, possibility to block this uh, this conservative force by the population by the citizen. Right. Um, so my, let me, um, how to begin. Um, along with a, a co-author, Bojan Bogarj, uh, I'm publishing a book in, I think it's scheduled for October now, uh, about, subtitle is, I think, uh, Constitutionalism After Populism. And what we talk about, we were of course aware of that kind of literature. Um, both of us are law people, not political theory people in the way that Mouffe and Pettit are. Um, and as law people, we think more about institutions than political theorists do. And so we say actually uh, early in our book that we're interested in populism and institutionalizing populism in a constitutionalist way, but we assume that there are going to be political parties in a populist constitutionalist system. I don't think Pettit and Mouffe see things that way. They see the people as organized, if at all, in non-party forms, um, maybe through social movements. Uh, 
but um, so so I, so my reaction is that at, at sort in the last chapter of our book we develop or sketch I think is a better way to put it a set of institutions that might allow for agonistic contestation among the people um, in large scale democracies. That's another issue that you have to worry about. Um, uh, and they would, the, the institutions that we have are not party institutions. Um, they're strongly decentralized, devolved institutions. Um, various citizens assemblies at a very low level. Um, I guess my reaction is that unless you do something like that, unless you think in institutional terms, the idea of agonistic contestation can't be brought to ground in a real world constitution making process. Now, I should say, you know, if those folks were in a constitutional convention or were advising people in a convention, I'm sure that they could come up with institutions that would be vehicles for agonistic contestation. Um, but at the level of political theory, they haven't done so. I should actually say one last point on this. Um, earlier this year, maybe late last year, a political theorist named Camille Vergara, who's I think Argentinian, published a book that ends with a very elaborate institutional way of capturing uh, this kind of contestation. Um, and, you know, she could go to Chile and talk to those people. Uh, but that's what's needed. Okay, that my view is figuring out the institutional form of that kind of politics uh, is uh, what's needed. Professor Rodrigo Brandão, I would like to, to hear your comments, please. Thank you, Rafael. Just a brief comment. First of all, I would like to congratulate Professor Rafael, Professor Luiz, and Professor uh, Cristina Gallo for promoting this wonderful event. I would like also to thank Professor Tushner. It's always a pleasure to hear. It's always an opportunity to learn a lot. The uh, first comment uh, that I would like to make uh, is about the importance of this political view about the constitutional making process. In Brazil, we have here, Professor, a, a strong tradition of uh, treating uh, this question with the French approach of pouvoir constituant, uh, an idea completely idealized, sometimes uh, even theological, about the constituent power uh, that is completely unreal. Uh, and when you uh, emphasize uh, the importance of political uh, preconditions on the constitutional making pro process is very important in Brazil. We, we have already studied a lot uh, Ackerman uh, approach that's more based on our, uh, an historical perspective uh, and also John Elser, but your approach is very important and, and that's my comment. Uh, I think it's very important in Brazil particularly because uh, ordinary politics uh, had a huge importance in our uh, drafting process. Uh, for example, uh, we have here the president of um, uh, the commission that uh, edited our constitution was Mario Covas uh, from the same political party of President Fernando Henrique Cardoso. A and he were far more uh, much um, left-wing uh, than the average Congress, Brazilian Constitution, Constitution Assembly. Uh, and for this reason, the first test approved of our Constitution was for a far more left, leftist than 
uh, it would be expected from our Congress. And we had a strong reaction from a conservative group of parties that's called Centrão that uh, cut off uh, important uh, progressist um, questions that were approved, like land reform in Brazil. So uh, ordinary politics plays uh, played a great role in Brazil constitution uh, process. And uh, a final comment uh, that I'd like to say and ask, it's a question. Uh, I would love to hear uh, a little bit about what you said about this uh, crowdsourcing, constitutional making in current uh, process. Uh, I think that Brazil lives a uh, similar situation, not completely, but have some similarities with Chile, because here in June uh, 2013, we have street de demonstrations of dissatisfaction uh, with political parties and all the mainstream in Brazilian politics and economics. Uh, and we also have huge inequality like Chile. So uh, I think these similarities um, it, that they are important and, and maybe they can uh, review a situation where uh, in a context of high polarization, uh, the influence of ordinary politics much be even higher than we had in our constitution. So my final question, sorry if I talk too much, uh, but uh, is I would like to, to hear in that panel uh, with Bruce Ackerman, we didn't have time, uh, and I would like to ask this question. Uh, what do you think about this idea of a uh, new constitution for, from Brazil or Chile or uh, this kind of countries that lives that kind of street uh, demonstrate? demonstrations of dissatisfaction with political parties and uh, deals with a high degree of polarization. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you. So uh, a couple of comments on your last points. Um, the first is um, just a clear disclaimer. Uh, I'm an outsider and the decision about Brazil's constitution has to be for Brazilians. And whether you know, the one you have now uh, is adequate or inadequate um, is a decision that, that Brazilians have to make uh, with a footnote that <clears throat> the um, performance of the system over the past decade is not encouraging uh, uh, the extent to which it's rooted in the constant the, that performance is rooted in the constitution I think is a, a, a very complicated question um, just as an outsider I want to say uh, we outsiders uh, may be distracted by um, the fact that for, I think, quite contingent reasons, you ended up with Bolsonaro as president. Um, it's not clear to me that that's uh, best attributed to your constitutional system. On the, on the other hand, um, the um, general description of Brazil as having coalitional presidentialism, which I guess is the phrase that come from a Brazilian scholar um, um, has produced instability. Uh, and so it might be worth trying to figure out better ways of organizing things. And a constitution drafting process might be a better way of doing that with the qualification that having a system that is co coalitional presidentialism generate a drafting process is probably going to generate a process that's just as flawed as the ordinary lawmaking process. 
And so, and this is again the kind of the second observation, kind of thing that I typically wouldn't do. I would what we do, what uh, Gorich and I do in our book at the end, say, yeah, the idea of crowdsourcing is really interesting. Um, it worked not so badly in Iceland, but that's 350,000 people. Um, it worked in a slightly different way in Ireland, which is bigger. Um, what about scaling it up to Brazil? And so in Iceland and Ireland, there was direct public participation in the national process. There was one single process, a convention, call it in both places, and the people of Ireland sitting, I do it this way, sitting in their homes at their computers, communicated with the national convention. That's not going to scale uh, in a place like Brazil. Uh, what we suggest is uh, 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 a system of um, hierarchically organized citizens assemblies starting in neighborhoods uh, and then expanding to um, larger scales in which ordinary citizens at the neighborhood level could actually talk about what they thought the constitution should be. And there would be party influence, but it would be distributed differently and probably less effective just because there are too many of these uh, for the parties to uh, you know, control the process. And so you might get um, a um, decent citizen, a, a constitution drafted with a decent amount of real citizen participation that might not be dominated by the pathologies of ordinary politics that would otherwise uh, come into play. Um, I, I would say, you know, I, just to conclude on this one, um, I am familiar with a mostly admiring literature on participatory budgeting in Brazil. You people are more familiar with how it works and how satisfactory it is. Um, if it works the way it's described to the literature I read, uh, you know, participatory budgeting, sorry, um, participatory constitution making through neighborhood assemblies uh, might be worth exploring. It might be interesting for some political party to take that up as its agenda. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you, Rodrigo. Ana Paula, feel free to share your comments with us. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate all my friends that organized this. And I, I would like to thank you, Professor, for enlightening us with your brilliant speech. And uh, I have a question. Uh, considering that it's not, it's inconceivable to have a, a constitution draft in secrecy as American was, and considering the the popular participation that's somehow important, it's uh, much more important important than it was in the past, and especially the 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 way we have to conceal different interests political participation and popular participation in drafting a constitution. Uh, I have one question about one specific point. When we read about it, we uh, may, um, usually read about a country with two major parties, as you have in the States and in a lot of other countries. But would it be another uh, and trying to anticipate the possible constrictions, would it be more uh, difficult to conceal parties in a country where you don't have two major parties, but lots of parties with the power uh, more fluent through this? Would it be 
much more difficult and what we should uh, think to to deal with this one more problem when you don't have a big party or two big parties to conduct these negotiations and drafting a constitution. So it's clear that uh, the more formally organized political parties there are, the more complicated the process is going to be. That's just ordinary politics is more complicated under those circumstances. Um, two observations. One actually encouraging for a Brazilian-like situation uh, is that where the parties are, or many of the parties, are vehicles for mere personal advancement, not ideologically organized, um, then I think actually the opportunity for um, a decent constitution drafting process may, may increase, may be better. Partly because of the veil of ignorance issues. The, you know, the ambitious politician who has formed a party um, uh, can't really know what, what to agitate for. Uh, you know, they can't really know what to agitate for that would be to his or her personal advantage. It's just too complicated. Um, in an existing system, you can game things out. Okay, but where the rules are up for grabs, it's very hard to know what you could do. Um, um, so that, you know, maybe, you know, a multi-party system with 15, well, you have 17 parties in your cabinet now or something like that. Uh, um, uh, it might be in a multi-party system with 12 ideological parties would be really terrible uh, because they would be able to uh, operate within the constitutional uh, drafting exercise. The more personalistic the parties get, the less they're going to be able to do, um, uh, I think. The other thing is, is uh, obvious, and everybody who writes about uh, this kind of thing uh, will say it. Um, the first thing you have to do, uh, which you probably can do reasonably well, I'm, now that I say this, the first thing you have to do is to increase the threshold for entry into parliament. I don't know what it is in Brazil, but to get 17, it's got to be pretty low. Um, uh, you know, the standard numbers are five to seven percent. Um, that gets you down to a reasonable number of parties without forcing you into two or three. Um, but that's the first thing to do. And then once you're there, you can start thinking, you can start seeing how coalitional presidentialism would look different with 10 parties rather than 17. Um, and so then you'd be able to assess things. Now, I don't know whether <clears throat> increasing the threshold is politically or constitutionally achievable in Brazil, uh, but it's the, if it is, that's the first thing you do before engaging in a large scale exercise. Thank you again, Professor. Uh, Judge Cristina Teresa Gaulia, I thank you for your support and partnership. You were essential for the success of this project. Uh, do you have any final considerations? Okay. In fact, I would like to make a small final question. Um, because in Brazil, Professor, besides a multi-party system, we have um, people who are very uneducated 
uh, we have a seizure. The rich people are educated. The poor people are not educated. And the influence of religion, especially of Protestant churches, is immense, is huge. And I would like to hear a little bit your opinion about the danger, dangers of religious uh, influence in um, an amendment of the constitution in countries like Brazil and Chile, where the influence of religion is also huge for this process of making a new constitution. Before I say goodbye. No, thank you. So that's a that's a really uh, important question, of course. Uh, a uh, former student of mine, now colleague, uh, his name is Madhav Kosla, has this brilliant book about India and the framing of the Indian constitution in the late 1940s, where the founders expressly had the view that uh, there were real dangers in having a non-literate public voting to control the government, but were deeply committed to universal suffrage of in a highly a, a nation where the rates of non-literacy were extremely high. And they developed the theory, Kosler says, according to which participation in politics itself would be the form of political education or would generate political literacy, if not um, you know, formal education literacy. <clears throat> My take on that is, again, and this actually does address the uh, religious influence uh, point that um, in, in India, they were able to do that because the Congress party was dominant and penetrated down to the very lowest level. Uh, so uh, my vision would be to engage the public, again, the non politically literate public at the very lowest level, neighborhoods, convene neighborhood assemblies, where people will talk with their neighbors about how the government's organization, how organizing the government better could make their lives better. Um, and then again, sort of work from there. The reason I think that addresses the issue of religious influence is, first of all, in those kinds of exchanges, I just do it in, in crude, very crude kinds of ways, the Protestants are going to have to talk to the Catholics about what should be done. And it won't be a decent answer to the Catholics to say, my pastor says the Bible requires this. And, and there's some degree of experience with these kinds of exchanges. It's not tremendous and it's not overwhelming, but that when somebody says, my pastor says this to a Catholic who says, but my priest says something different and that's not gonna help us solve our problems. They actually start talking about the problems rather than the religious things that are you know, separating them. It's a very, that's a very optimistic view of what might happen. And I, you know, don't want to oversell it. But my own view is it's worth trying. So that's my last word. Professor Tushnet, as I said at the beginning, it was an honor for Emerge and for myself to take part in this assembly. And I'm looking forward for other meetings like that. I pray you liked the encounter also. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much. Uh, before I leave this, can I get a guarantee that I will get a link to the YouTube uh, version of this? Of course, Professor. Of course. Thank you. We will send you the link. So thank you again, Professor Mark Tushnet. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Teresa Gaulia, Luiz Cláudio, Ana Paula, Rodrigo Brandão, Daniel Bucar, nosso Procurador-Geral, Escola da Magistratura, for your partnership with us. It was a great pleasure. Look forward to receive you again in PGM and Emerge. And Professor, keep healthy. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor.